Uh, welcome to this week's uh, installment of Grand Rounds here at Marigulia Medical Center. Please make sure to fill out your evaluation forms at the conclusion of today's activity. We use those uh, to further our cause in developing uh, program content for this series. It's my pleasure to welcome a team of folks here today. I think that most people probably are familiar with Dr. Crano, McFarland Endocrinology, uh, Thera Cox, and Kimberly Case with the uh, Diabetic Education uh, Program here at Mary Gurley Medical Center. Uh, they are going to team up and talk about some updates in the uh, treatment of diabetes and also some technology updates as well. So please join me in welcoming uh, Thera, Kimberly, and Dr. Crano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me with this? I've never used one of these before. This is really something. Yeah, we have a tag team today. I'll start, and then I'll tag off to Thera, and then Kimberly, our newest addition, which we think is great for the hospital. We'll give a little uh, summary of her role in the hospital. Um, it is like was presented an update on type 1 diabetes mellitus. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in the management of this disease. It's become very technical, and in my age, that's become an issue. But I have great support from these ladies over here. We, we have so many new devices and new ways to treat our type 1 diabetics. I thought it would be a good opportunity for people to at least get updated what we're doing and hopefully feel more comfortable with the devices that you'll be seeing. We have hundreds if not close to thousands of patients now in our area that are using pumps and sensors and they're advancing every day. Um, they're great. They're, they've been a huge improvement in the management of the type 1 diabetic. And I'll give you a rundown a little bit about that. And I think Thera is going to give you a, a little summary of type 1 diabetes and diabetes in general. And then the, the little summary about the hospital service that we have, a uh, recent new hospital service that we have. And we'll have time for questions. Type 1 diabetes is a continuum. It's, it's not just one thing. There's the autoimmune process that is a huge component of causing a disease. Then there's also inflammatory changes and insulin resistance. And so we're seeing more and more insulin resistance even in our type 1 diabetics than we ever used to before. There used to be the old adage that type 1 diabetics were never overweight because of their disease. That is no longer the case. Um, it's also a misnomer. There's juvenile diabetes. That, that term has not been used for at least 20 years because two thirds of type one diabetics are actually diagnosed between ages 18 and 60. And as I said just a minute ago, obesity has become more of an issue in type one diabetes that we've never had before. And now we're dealing with more insulin resistance. We do have tests that are being used more because we see more and more patients being diagnosed later in life, what's called LADA or latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. And these tests that we can do can help us differentiate whether we're dealing with a type 1 or type 2 diabetic as they, even though you could say, gee, they're, they're 65 years old, how can they be a type 1 diabetic? Well, it does happen, and it happens more than you realize. There's these GAD antibodies that can occur at any age. They're probably more reliable than the insulin autoantibodies that we also can order. And these tests are used quite frequently in the DPP trial. It's a diabetic prevention program that's been ongoing for years, Calc getting patients that are family members of type 1 diabetics and having them screened for these antibodies to see if they're at risk for developing type 1 diabetes. We can use them too in the clinical status, in the clinical office. When, when trying to differentiate between type one and type two. But if, they, if they're negative, it doesn't necessarily rule out type one diabetes. Another test that we're forced to do quite frequently by, the, by Medicare as we have more and more of our Medicare patients using pumps and sensors is a C-peptide, which is a marker for endogenous insulin. And you have to have a low C-peptide level for Medicare to be a candidate for these devices. We'll talk more about that as I go into my talk. So the bottom line is what we're trying to do in our diabetic population is control their diabetes. There are numerous studies that have been done through the years, dating back now 25 years. Uh, the, 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 go, the gold standard test was the DCCT, Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, that got completed in the early 90s. It, differ, it 
put patients into two different categories. One was considered conventional treatment, which was subcutaneous injections twice a day, and then intensified, which was multiple daily dose injections. There weren't too many pumps at that time, but pump patients that were using it were also in the intensified program. And the difference between those that had conventional treatment and intensified treatment with regards to the complications was ex uh, unbelievable. It was like 75% reduction of complications. So with that information, for the past 25 years, there's been a, you know, a huge push to trying to better control type 1 and type 2 diabetics. In the type 1 realm, we've come more and more and more with technology to get to those goals. So I'll briefly discuss CGMs, which stand for continuous glucose monitors. Smart pens will be very brief, and if you want to talk more about that, I'd like you to do that, because that's kind of a, a bridge between pumps and multiple daily dose insulin regimen, and then pumps, okay? And they have some sample devices that they'll be showing you as I go along. Continuous glucose monitors, of course, c compared to finger stick blood glucose monitoring and A1Cs. The A1C is a test that you probably see ordered a lot, at least by our office, is an average blood glucose over the previous two to three months. It's a good test, but if you have a lot of peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs, you can be fooled. You can have a patient that may have an A1C of 7%, which is acceptable yet they're up and down, hypoglycemic, hyperglycemic, and their control truly is not good. These CGMs show you that. They show you what the pattern of the blood glucose is day to day. So they are better when it comes to seeing what the control is. Um, hypoglycemia is also better documented and hopefully avoided with the CGM device which is a huge problem that I don't think we knew as much about until we started using CGMs. There's several CGMs. Uh, they have some devices here. There's the Medtronic, I didn't put it in, but it's called the Guardian system. There's the Dexcom, which is the most recent new one that's on the market is a G6. And there's a Freestyle Libre that you see, I think advertised very much on TV. It's the one that you see on the back of people's arms that's been advertised and promoted quite a bit. What are the indications for these devices? Well, in our estimate, estimation, all adult and pediatric patients with type 1 diabetes, they all qualify. Uh, anybody that's getting intensive insulin therapy, whether it be multiple daily dose or a pump, frequent low blood glucose problems, Hypoglycemic unawareness, that's a complication that occurs usually in people who have had diabetes for an extended period of time where they don't sense their low blood sugars. They don't know when they're low. And they could go, you know, pass out, go into a coma. Excessive glucose variability, variable activity, and if the patient's willing and able to use and receive education. You can see that pretty much everybody with type 1 diabetes is going to qualify for the CGM. Uh, the Dexcom G6 that I think is being passed around. The neat thing about this one is that you can see that they've had a variety of, of uh, updates. It's gone G1, 2, 3, it's up to 6 now. The G6 is the first one of that device that does not have to be calibrated. In other words, we don't have to do finger sticks. Uh, they can wear this for 10 days. It's water resistant, good adhesive, usually stays in place. And there's... In, with previous sensors, there's been a Tylenol acetaminophen interference that is not the case with Dexom G6. You can use it as young as two years old. It integrates with your iPhones, your iWatch, and even now I think with the Samsungs. I think they started, I think they've got that corrected. Um, it alarms if you're getting low or high. You set levels for where you want to be alarmed. It gives glucose data to family members. In other words, if they have iPhones, you can have five other people be your voyeur and watch everything you do uh, while with, with regards to your blood sugars, and they can call you up and say, hey, your blood sugar is getting low. Uh, what are you doing about that? So it's kind of neat. And they're accurate. You know, the mean absolute relative difference is 9%, the average error. That's the average error between measuring blood glucose and CGM. They're very accurate. The Libre, which you see, like I said, advertised, I think, the most of all these sensors. 
has been available now for uh, almost two years. It's also factory calibrated, so you don't have to do finger sticks. This one lasts up to 14 days, water resistant, easy to use, measures glucose can, you know, every minute, records the value. Every 15 minute displays for the most recent eight hours, it can be, uh, you can intermittently scan with it, displays the blood glucose every time you swipe. And it has a very good MIRD also. So it's very accurate. One that I have not personally used, but I think it has a place for some athletes, especially swimmers. I've tried to get a couple of people to use it, but I think because of the cost and the not being covered by the insurance, they never did get it. It's a pill-sized sensor implanted underneath the skin, changed out every three months. It's rechargeable, requires at least two calibrations, though a day, in other words, you gotta do a finger stick blood glucose to make sure that it's calibrated and giving you accurate readings. It lasts three months, so every three months you have to come in and have it changed out. It has alerts, it vibrates, you feel your arm vibrating, and it, uh, and it also can work with iPhones and Android. I think it's a, a neat kind of designer sensor that's gonna be good for some people, especially athletes. Why do we like these things so much? Not only is it good for the patient and good for them to try to get better control, it's good for us when they come into our office. We download, in my office, and I don't know about Dr. Rivas, but probably the two of us, 25 downloads a day of our patients that are on these devices. And our, my nursing staff, who's back there, does a phenomenal job of getting these things done. It's, it's kind of a pain, but it's worth every minute. The information we get is just so different than when I first practiced medicine. We'd look at three blood sugars and say, oh, you're doing great. Uh, now we have hundreds of values to look at and patterns and how they're doing, when we should be making adjustments, where we should be making adjustments. And it's just not based on that A1C. The A1C might be seven, 6.5%, but I still make adjustments because they're having hypoglycemia. And I would have never had that opportunity before without these devices. So what are our targets? Our targets are to try to get the patient in a range between 70 and 180 milligrams per deciliter. And how do we, what do we think we're, when we're doing well? It's usually 70% or more of the time they're in that range. 25% or less that they're above that range. And we really want to try to avoid the hypoglycemia. So less than 5% in the hypoglycemic range, which is less than 70. As I told you, these things are great, but in the Medicare population, we have to be very cognizant of who is a candidate. You know, they, they have very strict criteria, and if you don't follow the criteria, you won't get the device, or they'll take it away from you. Uh, the clinical indications for Medicare recipients to have this is hypoglycemia, unawareness, severe excursions, they have to be testing and submit, we have to submit this to Medicare, that they're testing at least four times a day. Uh, we can download their meters, so there is, you know, there's evidence of that. You can't, you can't fudge on that. They have to be giving themselves at least three insulin injections or using a pump, okay? They have to be seen in the clinic every six months to review the CGM and the diabetic treatment plan. Otherwise, they'd be taken away. That's for patients' sensors. It's even worse for pumps. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we do pumps? Now we're going to go into the pumps, okay? They're convenient. It gives such great flexibility compared to injectable insulin. I mean, just think of yourself. I mean, we have pens, the old days, vials and syringes, and they carry those things around and have them available for every time you eat or snack. And I can't tell you the number of times patients have said, oh, I, I forgot my pen because I went out to eat. And so their sugar is 500 after they get home. You know, it's just so convenient, and there's really no excuse for missing a dose when you have a pump. Uh, flexible, allows you to exercise more conveniently and more safely. Uh, eating out, as I just said, traveling, it's just an unbelievably improvement for people traveling, especially internationally. Uh, you know, if you delay meals or you, you have shift work and you're changing, this allows you to change. And the old, the old day, we couldn't do that. We had a lot of problems with 
hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia in people that had erratic schedules or a lot of travel. It also allows for less hypoglycemia because you have better control and better convenience and better dosing. People feel better when they have better, smoother blood glucose control. There's more precise dosing, and again, it's amazing. You can go down to tenth of a unit on the basal rates on some of these devices. Um, so very precise dosing, especially for people that are on very low doses of insulin, and that's the kids usually. Um, it allows you to calculate meal boluses, and it helps with the calculation of the meal boluses. And it allows you, okay, I made a mistake. You can do a correction bolus. Just think in the old days, you had to give yourself another shot. Now all you got to do is push a button, give yourself another bolus. If you under bolus because you didn't give enough. So it's, they're, they're just great devices. And we try to get every type 1 diabetic that comes through our door on a pump and sensor. Right? I do. I'm not always successful, but I do. <laughs> Uh, your A1C is going to change. It's going to get better in most people, at least 0.2 to 0.4% drop. And those are the ones that are well controlled when they switch over to a pump. Uh, we're, we're getting software that helps calculate doses. As I told you, they allow lower, more very, very sensitive dosing of um, insulin, especially in some of those younger kids, even infants. There's uh, our pediatric endocrinology uh, colleagues are using these from the minute they're diagnosed. I don't think that I can remember. I mean, I, I, I know that their standard of care now is if you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as an infant or a child, they want you on a pump right away. They, they try to get the pump gone right away. And I give them credit for that. That's not easy. It's hard for the parents more than the kid, but they, they do pursue this, this treatment right away. And they need very low doses of insulin, so these pumps can do that. If you have variable exercise and activity, there's another complication of diabetes called gastroparesis. It's nerve damage to the gut motility, so people don't empty their gut, and they tend to have the food sit there longer. They get nauseated, sometimes vomit. But because they don't have their food trans, you know, go into the small intestine, there can be more of a cause for more of an uh, incidence of hypoglycemia because it's not getting into the jejunum where it needs to be absorbed. This helps allow for some variability of the dosing to try to avoid those hypoglycemic events. People that don't sense low blood sugars, the pumps are great along with the sensor. And then we have the other end of the spectrum where we have patients that are requiring huge doses of insulin, 500 to 1,000 units of insulin a day. And it allows us to use pumps in those patients with this, and this uh, product called regular U500, which is five times the concentration of usual insulin. So we're able to put more insulin into the pump, which only most of these pumps, the most they hold is 300 units, maybe 450. Okay. So, and even those people with severe insulin resistance, we can use pumps and we use U500 regular insulin. Uh, the newer pumps with the sensors have the a suspend feature. Uh, the pump suspends when the blood sugar starts to drop. So this has to be a pump that integrates with the sensors. And there's, and you guys can talk more about that or show them the devices, but there's a couple of pumps that do that right now. Where we, it's the Medtronic and the, uh, the uh, T-Slim tandem that integrate with the different sensors. Once the sugar starts to rise, the pump will go and start back up, okay? So it's very important, especially for management of and prevention of nocturnal hypoglycemia. So we think that, that that suspend feature has been a huge improvement and advancement in the management of type 1 diabetes. Um, the pumps have basal rates. So these are basically the rates that take the place of the long-acting basal insulins that you know as the Glargine, Lantus, Traceba, Levamir, those agents we don't use in pumps. All pump insulin is rapid acting, usually Lispro or Aspart, which are Humalog and Novolog. Uh, those are the two most common insulins. That's the only insulin we use, unless we're using the U500 that I told you about for the insulin resistant patient. There's a basal rate, then there's the bolus dosing and the computer in the pump with the sensor can help calculate the the dosing of mealtime insulin. 
variety of different ways we can administer the basal rates as tended. Uh, I mean, the bolus, the bolus dosing as described here. Most of the time, it's just a usual bolus delivery for the carbohydrate intake and premium blood glucose, but in certain situations, there'll be extended boluses. Medicare guidelines, I told you, it got a little harder to get the Medicare approval for insulin pumps, but we do it with the help of our staff over here. We get, um, as long as they're type one diabetic and they're willing to do these things, we get pumps for them. And we have a number of Medicare population on, on uh, pumps. Um, they have to have an elevated A1C. Uh, another thing that is, helps them get the pump is that they have recurring hypoglycemia, wide fluctuations and severe excursions, but they also have to be testing four times a day or already using a CGM for at least two months. They have to have a low C peptide and they give you the criteria here of less than 110% of the lowest level with the lowest uh, uh, reference range level with blood glucose that's less than 225. So you have to have a blood glucose that's in the kind of normal to slightly elevated range with a low C peptide. And then another thing that can help get the pump is if you have elevated antibodies I told you about that are consistent with type one diabetes. So there's a lot of criteria. If you go through the hoops, the, ro the, you know, the, the, the appropriate um, guidelines, you can get them. So we, we have more and more patients, Medicare patients on pumps. Smart pens, I'm going to just briefly talk about, and if you want to talk more about that, uh, I'll let Thera. It's, as we say, more of a bridge between MDI, which is multiple daily incident injections with pens and pumps. There's a lot of people that don't want to pump for one reason or another, especially the elderly patient that uh, just says, I don't want to deal with anything like that. There's cost that sometimes is an issue with getting a pump. Although these are also not inexpensive, but they are less than a pump. They are an insulin pen basically with a computer and the information that it can be sent to your smartphone. And basically it helps you with knowing the dosing that you've given, what insulin you have on board, how much insulin to give for your carbohydrate intake. So it's, it's kind of a, a neat system that integrates with your iPhone and allows you to kind of have a, a poor man's pump, if you want to call it that, with, with, a, with a smart insulin pen. You can also share the data with your family. Uh, there's the newer insulins that are now available, and I believe just recently got approved for pump use. It's fast-acting aspart, FIASP. It's faster than the current insulins, about two-fold higher insulin exposure after 30 minutes, and about 75% greater action within the first 30 minutes. So it works quicker. So we're seeing, in some cases, it's definitely going to be an improvement. We're still waiting for approval by a number of the insurance carriers because it's fairly new and it's just recently been approved in pumps. But I think we're gonna be using more and more of this in our pump patients because it's faster acting for those mealtime boluses that often are difficult to control. Inhaled insulin, you probably heard a lot about this. There's been inhaled insulin on the market for the last 20 years, some type of product. They usually get taken off the market because of side effects or cost. This is the one that's on the market right now. It's inhaled, a Frieza. It's fairly easy to use. It's very helpful in some patients. But again, the reason we aren't using it as much as I'd like to is getting it approved through the insurance. They often deny it because of cost, but it's an ultra rapid acting incident. It works very quickly. It peaks in 15 minutes. Uh, with this, there seems to be, and we use it for mealtime insulin. It's not, you know, you still have to usually use a basal insulin, but in some individuals that really don't want to take shots, it's an option. It's like one basal insulin shot plus taking the Afriza at every meal and snack. And there's less weight gain, less hypoglycemia. Uh, you can't use it if you've got chronic lung disease. And you have to get baseline spirometry and then check it at six months and then annually to be sure you're not getting any reduction of, of the FEV1. But in general, if they have decent lungs, they do very well with this medication. I probably have five people on Afriza. And it's worked very well. Uh, like I said, I'd have more, but there's the cost issue. Sometimes they'll get a cough and sore throat, but in general, it's very well tolerated. That's another new thing in diabetes that is great. Uh, we're coming more and more toward what we call the closed loop system or artificial external pancreas. That's using the CGM with pumps. Now we already have that, like I told you, and they, they have the basal 
the basal IQ, which basically suspends the insulin if you're getting low and then starts back up when it starts to come back up. We have the control IQ and the uh, auto mode, which are these are different names for the one that tries to bring the high levels down. But we don't have the whole loop yet. That's going to be when the, uh, when the FDA finally approves these algorithms that, are be, that have been developed by the pump companies that calculate mill time boluses also. So not only will you, they be adjusting the basal rates for lows and highs, but they'll also be adjusting the mill time boluses based on what the computer is told the carbohydrate intake is going to be and what the, uh, where the blood sugars are with the sensor. And it will bolus the amount of insulin that's felt to be appropriate based on carbohydrate, insulin to carbohydrate ratios, correction factors. It's, it's basically going to be as close as we get for a while to an artificial external pancreas. And I say it's going to be here for what I hear in the next year or two. The other area that gets limited time spent on, and this is the last part of my talk, so I'll give you more time, is hypoglycemia. We uh, did, never took good care of it for years, but I think that we have some new products that allow us to be more aggressive, and I really hope you talk to your patients when you see them about hypoglycemic management. It's often not acknowledged or asked about. I do at all my appointments, but I don't think it's a common thing done. The glucagon products that we've had before are very difficult to use. To ask a non-medical person to take a syringe, and draw out saline, inject it into a, a vial of glucagon powder, shake it up, draw it back out, and then give your loved one a shot, that's asking a lot, you know? So in general, we didn't see too much glucagon used by other than EM, EMTs or paramedics. New preparations, will are now available i don't know if you've heard about them so we're going to talk about them because i think they're a great new addition to care of type 1 di of diabetics that are on insulin that don't have to be type 1 any any diabetic on insulin what are the categories the ada categorizes severe hypoglycemia as requiring assistance uh, symptomatic episode is blood glucose less than 70 but not necessarily requiring assistance asymptomatic is less than 70 and not even knowing it just saying, oh, look, I was 60, I was 55. Probable symptomatic is symptoms without measuring and relative episodes of symptoms, but blood glucose greater than 70. You know, some people think they're low when they're 105. Um, hypoglycemia is greater in diverse populations, people with renal failure, women more than men, African-Americans, elderly, they lose their sense of hypoglycemia quickly, all these individuals, especially the renal failure and the elderly. Hypoglycemic unawareness is a complex event, an inability to sense low blood sugars. The treatment, which we, you know, it's hard to get some of these patients to do because they want to have good control of their diabetes, is to actually let the blood sugars run slightly higher for two to three months to restore that autonomic pathway, nerve reflex. And it's, it's sometimes hard to get them to do, but that's the way to do it. Now, hypoglycemia has been a big problem with control because it's a barrier to, to, for a lot of people to get the control because they purposely maintain their blood sugar high because they fear hypoglycemia. They fear attending social events. Their companion is anxious because what if my loved one has a hypoglycemic event? And there's higher mortality and because of greater number of cardiovascular events in people that have had hypoglycemia. So it's, it's something we really do our best to try to avoid. But if it does happen, we do have some new products. Glucagon. Glucagon, I told you about, it's cumbersome, hard to use. We now have, just for the past few months, a medication, nasal glucagon. It's called Baximi. It's three milligrams standard dose. It comes as a, in a canister, as a nasal spray. It's a powdered glucagon. It can be used for anybody over age four. It's a one-use device. It actually has a 24-month shelf life if it's not used. And I don't know if we have any samples of that. No. Darn. Well, it's really neat, and it's so much easier. So if somebody's hypoglycemic and you know where, the, where this product is, hopefully you being the loved one of someone that, that has uh, 
type 1 diabetes would know where this product is. It's in the purse or in the pocket or somewhere in the home, and they can just go and spray it in the nose instead of having to do that cumbersome glucagon injection I told you about. The other one that's become available just in the past couple of months is Gvoke. It's a pre-filled syringe, one milligram dose for children over 12. I mean, for, for anyone over 12 and a half milligram dose for less than 12. It's a pre-filled syringe of glucagon, and it has a shelf life of a year to 18 months, I think. So you don't have to do the reconstitution of the powder. It's simple to use. Just You grab it, you give the shot. There are some other products that are used in type 1s, but are not FDA approved. Pramlatine or Amlin, it helps lower the post-meal blood glucoses. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors have been used. GLP-1s. Uh, some of the, you know, metformin, some of the SGLT, the sodium glucose transport inhibitors. They're all do help lower the blood sugars, but there are added side effects and concerns. So none of them are approved by the FDA. In certain situations, usually in the very obese, insulin-resistant patient, we do use some of these products. But I leave that to the endocrinologist. But just to let you know, there are some other products you may see on the list in type 1s that are being used. Uh, a lot of research, a lot of prevention studies going on, early reversal studies. It's an exciting time in type 1 diabetes, and I'll give the floor to Thera and Kimberly so they can give you a little more about that. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we're good. All right, great. All right, well, I'm Thera Cox, and I'm the supervisor of the Diabetes and Nutrition Education Department. Um, I have a fascinating job. It's interesting every day. And um, if you ever want to read good research, look into diabetes research, because it is fascinating, the things that they're learning. So um, just a couple things from Dr. Crano's talk. The, in, um, the smart pens, those are new. They came out this summer, I believe, and we're just starting to see some patients that we're putting onto the smart pens, primarily people who would really benefit from being on a pump, but they do not have the ability to manipulate and manage an insulin pump. So this is kind of like the best thing we can do for them is to use the, the pens. And we, we've only got a couple patients so far on them, so I can't really talk about um, too much about what it's like for patients, but we do have people very interested in it. So I think time will tell how much use we get of those devices. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. And then um, I wanted to just show you guys a couple things so you got, I passed around the Libre Swipe uh, CGM. This is the Dexcom receiver. So for someone who doesn't use a cell phone, like some of our elderly patients, they don't have smartphones. That's just too much for them. So they can just get a basic little receiver like this, this that they can utilize, and it'll alarm if they're low or if they're going high, things like that. So there all, are alternatives to that. Um, and then... The Omnipod um, little trans, I don't, what do they call that, Kimberly? The, the way they run their pump. <laughs> they have a special name for it, but anyway, yeah. what's it called? Personal Data Manager. Right, PDM, there you go. I don't train on that one, so I don't know the name of that particular one, but the one I passed around is their new one. This is their old one. So you can see, if you got to hold the new one, this baby's pretty clunky and chunky and not very um, easy to put in your pocket or wherever you store it. So their new version is this one that I passed around for you guys to see. And it is much, um, it is, it will then become their platform to run their suspension of insulin and eventually probably their um, hybrid, not not their closed loop, but at least their first step towards that. Um, and that's where they're going. They're just a little bit behind the curve on that. But for people who wear a pod, it is considered a, an Omnipod pump is tubeless. So the other pumps we sent around, you're connected to where you insert 
um, into your body with a tube that runs then to your device like this. When you wear an Omnipod, all you do is have this stuck on your body. It's filled with the insulin, and then you run it with that little device. So there's lots of people who really don't like the tubes, so they are very excited to have the option to be able to use a pod instead. And we do have a good number of athletes that we've put these on, and they've been, I mean, a lot of them are high-performing athletes, and they do amazingly well. It's much easier for them to use something like this versus the tubing and all those types of things. So um, a good option for them. And then this is the tandem pump. I didn't send this around, but this is more, there's your tube, you can see. And again, this little pump is nice and small. It's so easy to use. It's just a touch screen. It's like a cell phone. People get onto this and do really, really well with this. And then the oldest one I sent around, which was the Medtronic pump. So believe it or not, that pump came out three years ago, I think, three, four, something like that. And it was like revolutionary in its time. And now here we are in 2020 and nobody wants that pump. It's still a really good pump, and some people, their insurance dictates they have to have that pump, but most people want the tandem pump now um, or the Omnipod because they're getting smaller and smaller, much easier to use. The, the programming and all those things are easy. Plus, the tandem and the Omnipod pump go with the Dexcom G6. So that Dexcom G6 sensor, we have people who have had diabetes, type 1 diabetes, for over 50 years. It's the first time in their whole life since they were diagnosed that they don't have to poke their finger. And that is obviously consumers want that because that changes their lives. And they're very happy with the results of that. Um, so it's, it's a fascinating field, like I said, and um, it's super fun to be part of that. So oh, I'll put all my toys away. Find my little, okay. Sorry. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to just briefly talk about some data for you guys just to let you know that our department won't be going out of business anytime soon. Um, that's primarily what I thought I'd just share with you. So this is from the Healthy People 2020 um, study that was done. And basically, they looked back to 2005, 2008, and looked at the rate of obesity among adults age 20 and older. Um, and it was at around 33.9%. And then in 2013, 16, it rose all the way up to 38.6% among uh, adults greater than 20. Um, the Iowa data that came out last year showed that we've become a much more obese state. Um, there's 36.4% of adults are obese now. And a lot of that plays into what Dr. Crano spoke about, which is that people with type 1 diabetes did not used to be people who had to worry about their weight, generally speaking. But because our whole society has changed in the way people eat, we now see that they're much more obesity, even in type 1 patients. Um, so we're the fourth most obese state in the country. Not something to really to brag about. Kind of like the caucus problem. You know, don't want to talk about it. Right. Um, and then health implications 2030 is another um, research article that I sort of jumped into briefly. And it, it just shows, and I'm not going to read all this to you, but this shows you the projected cases of diabetes for the year 2030. We're currently at like 262. 100,000, and we'll be up closer to the 3,700 um, a mark by the time we get to 2030. And then heart disease, look at the jumps in heart disease and in obesity-related um, cancer cases. You really see huge, huge bumps in those things. And again, those things are tied to our obesity rate in this country. So it's kind of scary, actually, to look at that. Good news with kiddos, though. So this gives you some stats, again, with children. Um, I, unfortunately, in Iowa, our rate has gone up some. But across the country, we are starting to see some flattening with children. So that's encouraging. I think we're starting to find some things that we know we should be doing to help kind of bend that curve, because obviously that will impact future adults. Um, the last statement, though, I found pretty profound, which is that children are 10 times more likely to be obese than 40 years ago. So if you think about that, um, that's pretty significant. So, okay, 
so just a reminder of all the services we provide at the Diabetes Center. Um, we help people to prevent diabetes now, and we also help people to live with diabetes. And so this is just a list of all of our programs. A couple new ones I wanted to point out. Um, we do have this amazing program um, called the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program. And we see just tremendous success with our Medicare population when they come into the DPP. Um, I would say that our weight loss, the target's always between five and around 8%. But I know Liz just finished a group and they were at like 10 per, 12? Right around seven. 7%. And their activity minutes were 270 minutes per week was her average for those people. So they just embrace this program and do really well. So refer people to that program. They don't pay a penny. It's a no deductible program. So we would love to have more referrals. And then another new one we started this year, which um, is really exciting. It's towards the bottom. It's called Mom Post. And Mom Post is a uh, blended learning situation for women who have been pregnant and had gestational diabetes. So they are at much higher risk to convert to type 2 diabetes, and we're trying to help bend that curve as well. And Liz has been instrumental in um, developing this program. There's no cost to people, so we don't have a barrier of any financial things. But it's basically a way that women can participate in the diabetes prevention program, but they do it on their time schedule. They don't have to come to a class because that's a huge barrier for a, a new mom or a mom who works and has kids. So um, that's very exciting to see see how that will go. And I know participation's been good and people are really enjoying it. So, and then last, Kimberly, so come on up here, Kimberly. Um, we have started um, a program using a nurse practitioner in the hospital because we knew we had lots of gaps where we just weren't able to manage our diabetes patients when they were hospitalized the way we wanted um, that to happen. So Kimberly has joined our team. She's a nurse practitioner, comes by way of uh, Mayo Clinic in Austin, Minnesota. And and um, we are so glad she's here. <laughs> yep, I should be going the right direction. You guys can all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. So um, my position came about because there are a lot of new technological advances out there. And as Dr. Carino and Dr. Riva are pushing patients out the doors with pumps, they're coming into the hospital with these pumps on and CGMs on. And so just giving you that support that you need to know how to function with them when they're in the hospital. Um, my main goal is to improve the outcome of these individuals with diabetes. So obviously when they come in, if they have diabetes, their risk for things like infection, um, longer hospital stays, complications and readmissions are higher. My support to you as nursing staff and other staff here in the hospital is to help you manage these pumps and CGMs. So if you see somebody come in with one, please give me a call. Um, and I wanted to take off of that too. When they do come in, um, mentioned some of these pumps have what's called auto mode. Please be sure your patient is not running in auto mode. That needs to be shut off and they need to be put into manual mode. Um, because we don't want that CGM directing what's going on with their insulin administration. We want to have that in manual, okay? Um, another thing, just because they have that pump attached to them, same thing for that CGM attached to them, does not mean that it is working. Um, it could be that the site is bent or kinked, and if you have a glucose level that's going up and you're questioning it, feel free to take that pump off and give them an injection. Um, we need to do some troubleshooting there. With your CGM also, they can be damaged and they may not be accurate. So the number that you are getting might not be correct. So even though they have that CGM and we have told them that they are very accurate within that 9% <laughs> range, you need to get a finger stick glucose for any insulin administration or treatment. Um, I think that's, that's all the big ones that I want. Oh, no, one more. If you have a patient with type 1 who comes in and they do need to come off the pump, please, please, please be sure that they are given long-acting insulin. We cannot just be covering them with sliding scale 
um, treating their glucose as it goes up because we can send them into DKA very quickly. Uh, going through the rest of my list here. Um, I will help you with the U500. That is a very concentrated insulin, as Dr. Carino said, and dosing on that is very scary. <laughs> Pharmacy draws it up and sends it up to you, so please uh, be sure that I'm seeing those patients. Um, if you have patients that are having high blood sugars, and whether it's because of surgery, infection, uh, whether they're on TPN, tube feedings, Feel free to have uh, referrals sent to me. I will gladly help see where we can put insulin, whether it's in the bag or timing it um, with their tube feedings so that we can get better glucose control. Um, and then as far as hypoglycemia, um, MPO status, different procedures, uh, again, give me a call. I will see what I can do to help get things where they need to go. And how do you get a hold of me? Uh, starting today, there should be a new consult in EPIC. Um, what you see there, IP consult to diabetes nurse practitioner, is the new order that will be in EPIC. Um, if you can't find it, you can also call the diabetes extension office, or extension at the office, um, extension at 2880, or you can call me at my extension, which is listed there, 2947. Questions for myself, Dr. Carino, or Thera? I have a question for Thera. So um, for our Hispanic-speaking population, are, do you guys any, have any group classes or anything like that for nutrition that where Beatrice or Celia could come and translate for multiple people at one time? Because um, I know they, it's difficult for them to come spend several hours up at Diabetes Ed, but I think there's a big nutritional gap for a few of my patients. So so currently what we um, do primarily is use the language line and we can utilize that to have that conversation with them or to use the mobile device we have at Mary Greeley that allows for a, a conversation to occur. Um, we do use the translator sometimes too. So um, we have a variety of ways that we try to manage that. We unfortunately do not have a Spanish speaking educator. That would be a great addition to our team. Um, but at this point, those are the main resources we have. So we but we have worked with many people who um, do have alternative languages. We've got patients who are deaf, who we work with as well and blind. So we, you know, we do whatever we can is necessary to be able to meet their needs. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. I heard something on the radio this morning. I didn't hear the whole story on therapy dogs identifying hypo and hyperglycemia. Is that silly or is that a thing? I believe that is true for animals that are trained to recognize that. Uh, I don't think we have anybody that in our practice that we know of that has an animal um, that does that for them. I think it's been used with children um, and, and works really well. But um, as far as I know, we don't have anybody in our practice. I don't know if Dr. Crano or Riva. No. Other questions? Yeah, so a, a consult to you for the uh, Medicare patient with the abnormal fasting glucose. Is that the same ref uh, outpatient referral that we would use for a diabetic ed in general? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then to get the uh, inpatient uh, consult for the uh, diabetes, can the nurses enter that without... Um, asking the physician, or does it have to come from uh, who's ever met the <laughs> physician? We're working on that. It's supposed to come. From, it's yeah. supposed to come from the provider um, as a consult. But I've had nurses that have said, "Can you please?" And if nothing else, I will just give you a call and say if it's okay, see if it's okay. Yep. I don't expect an answer to this question. It's more of a philosophical statement. Uh, by the way, that was a very nice presentation by all three of you. So uh, I recently completed a book about the future of mankind called Homo Deus and a lot of over, overlapping themes about artificial intelligence. So as I listen to this lecture, I w I, and again, I don't expect an answer, but it's just something to ponder whether this is another chapter of machines taking over not only mankind or womankind, but the entire world. In this disease, I think it's about time that happens. 
Yeah, I would have to say, I mean, in our world, the um, the sensors have just been life altering for patients. Um, what they when they can actually look at the data and see what their glucose levels have been doing for the last 10, 14 days. Many of them are very profoundly affected by that because really they've never seen that like that. And so they make changes and they do start to really be, have behavioral changes that shift. Um, so it's very interesting. It is. One thing I forgot to mention was um, Dr. Crano mentioned lots of the um, CGMs. So a lot of our data now is actually, it is, it's in the cloud. So when you think about <laughs> artificial intelligence and things like that, I mean, the companies say that it's all very secure, um, but definitely, you know, that is the world we're, we're working in is all of those, that personal information goes into the cloud. And then more and more, we're going to be able to just pull that data out without, you know, without even seeing the patient, we could access their information and then guide their treatment. And trust me, that was my comment was not a criticism. It was an observation more than anything right, else. Right. Uh-huh. How, how much uh, the, the CGMs and the uh, insulin pumps uh, cost-wise, uh, you know, how much do they, what do they run? <clears throat> me to do that one or you want to do it? <laughs> and uh, also, uh, is the cost of insulin still going up? Uh, oh, there's, actually, they, they have a generic um, glargine now. Lispro, generic Lispro. Yeah, it's a little bit down, but it's a real problem, Mike. I mean, the, the cost of insulin is up 400% in the last 10 years. And um, cost of pumps are not inexpensive, as you can ex imagine. Um, but the coverage, if you have, and it always comes if you have insurance, the coverage for these devices, it is state-of-the-art, so it is covered fairly well. Now, there's definitely not a pocket, but... They do cover it, it, pumps and sensors, it, but it's high. It would high. seem if it cut down on complications, long-term complications, right. they, control, they, they, they get covered. come yeah. out ahead yeah. I mean, financially. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, the like pumps... Say, even, Medi even Medicare covers pumps as uh -huh. long as they fulfill those criteria. So, you know, that's... And Medicaid in Iowa will cover the um, Omnipod pumps. Mm -hmm. So we have people who are Medicaid recipients who are able to get that, and they can get the Freestyle Libre CGM. So that particular uh, sensor is much less expensive. So I would say in Iowa, we're, we're fairly blessed that we have very good coverage for those devices. But if you had to pay for a pump, they're... I don't know, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars. Plus, you have to pay ongoing for supplies. So, like I said, we're lucky to live where we do because it's it is a covered expense for most it's, people. It's very expensive, and insulin, I think, is a huge issue. I hope that that gets corrected mm -hmm. somehow for our patients to get the insulin that they require. I was going to say, and keep in mind too, you're going to do some cost shifting there too, because if you are on a non-pump program, you're paying for things like syringes, um, test strips, whereas if you have a CGM that you're not needing to calibrate, you're going to go through your test strips a lot less frequently, plus with you having um, your DME out of pocket, you'll meet that deductible really quickly. Um, so it's, it's kind of shifting the money in the pot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for coming. <laughs>